Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this event, right? Uh, sponsored by SAWAS and the Sheikh Zayed Book Award. Uh, the Sheikh Book Zayed Book Award is one of the world's leading prizes dedicated to Arabic literature and culture. Since 2006, the award has brought recognition, reward, and readership to outstanding work by authors, translators, publishers, and organizations around the world, right? In 2018, the award also launched a translation grant to help produce more quality Arabic books in translation outside the Arab world. The winning and shortlisted titles for the literature and children's literature categories are eligible for translation funding. Publishers from all over the world can apply to receive funding for the translation of one of these titles into any language. 16 books have been translated into multiple languages since the launch of the grant, including English, German, French, Italian, Greek, Georgian, and Ukrainian. In 2021, the award saw a growing interest in translation requests from Arabic into global languages, reiterating the importance of translation as an essential tool to build bridges between different nations and to represent cultures, literature and heritage in different languages. SAWAS is of course famous for its global reach and its commitment to the global South. SAWAS is a world leading center for the study of the Arab world with the high profile in cultural, literary and translation studies. The series of four events in April, May and June coincide with the award announcements in May. In these events, we'll bring together creative writers, translators, and researchers to talk about the role and place of Arabic culture and literature in today's ever increasing global connectedness. These events are advertised already, but you can look for them, look them up on the SAWAS website, keyword Sheikh Zayed Book Award. In today's event, which is the third of the series, we focus on children's literature as word literature. We all read children's literature as children, young adults, or grown-ups. We also read it to children. It is an integral part of our life of, of how we relate to children and of the ways in which we instill in our children values we believe in, pass on to them memories we cherish, share with them the stories we love and bring them up in our languages and word views through fun and game. However, I note two absences. One, the absence of Arabic children's literatures in word children's literature, and two, the absence of, this, the absence of children's literature in word literature or in considerations of word literature. We look at these two absences closely today. Where is Arabic children's literature? Who are the authors and what do they write about? What can explain the absence of Arabic children's literature in the world market and critical space? We have with us three distinguished panelists. Let me introduce them very brief, briefly and let them speak for themselves. Raja Malah is an architect from Morocco she holds a master's degree in urban planning from the Nantes uh, Paris University, France. In addition to her work as an architect in Dubai, she is interested in writing for children and young people. Her book, Mo'idi Ma'an Noor, My Date with the Light, has been shortlisted for the Sheikh Zayed Book Award in 2022 in the children's literature category, I mean, this year. Her most important publications are My Gift for Young for Your Birthday, 2018, The Wings of My Plane, 2019, Emerald Garden, 2020, Let Me Explain the Meaning of Immortality, 2021. She has also uh, literally translated works, most notably Ontology of Contemporary Emirati Poetry, 2007, where were they writing translation? Uh, where were they writing translation from French into Arabic? Um, this is 2000, this is this year, is it? 
And so that's Raja Malah. And then we have with us also Pam Dix. Pam worked in London in the school library sector and as a university lecturer in children's literature. She has been the chair of IBI UK since 2014 and is involved in many international projects to support this work. She's also the chair of the Akili Trust, a small charity that has been working in Kenya since 2008 and is a trustee for Book Aid International. She was the advisor editor of children's literature in a multiliterate world, published by UCL Institute of Education Press 2018. And we also have with us Charlotte Eyre. Charlotte Eyre is a freelance journalist and former children's editor as the bookseller, where she is still a previewer. At the bookseller, she wrote news and feature stories about the children's publishing industry programmed the annual children's conference and launched the YA Book Prize in 2014. She is a regular guest on radio programs such as Open Book on BBC Radio 4. All right, uh, before we sort of like, before I go ahead and explain today's format, let me do, so, do some housekeeping. Um, if you would like to hear right, this event in Arabic, please go to the bottom of your screen, click on an icon that looks like uh, Earth, a globe under which is written interpretation, and you can access this event in Arabic interpretation. So, uidu hadhi al-irshadat bil-Arabiya. لمن يحب الاستماع إلى الفعالية اليوم باللغة العربية فأرجو اللجوء إلى أسفل الشاشة على يدك اليمين ستجدون أيقونة بشكل كرة أرضية فقط عليك الضغط على الأيقونة فتجدون تعليمات إلى الاستماع إلى الفعالية بالترجمة العربية So that's number one Number two Right, uh, please sort of like use the question and answer function to pose your questions to us and to the audience. And three, this event will be recorded. And when it is ready, when the recording is ready, it will be posted on the SOAS YouTube channel and also the Sheikh Zayed Book Award YouTube channel. All right, now we will begin right now. So today's format, uh, uh, first, we have an hour, but can go beyond a little bit if there is interest. In to today's event, we will follow the this format, featured author, right? So we will talk to our author first, and then followed by panel discussion in the form of question and answers. And I'll pose the questions and ask the panelists to join me, right? We will start with Raja, Raja, right? Yeah. When did you start writing for children? First of all, I would like to thank you, Professor Wynn, for your introduction and thank you for your invitation. I would like also to express my thanks to all the audience. I'm very happy to be with you in this event to talk about the children literature in the world and especially in Arabic world. I will talk about it through my humble experience in this field. As you know, and as you can see, I did not follow the academic path to be writer for kids. Many of my friends and relatives are quite surprised to see me jumping from designing houses and cities to writing for kids. I, and I can understand the confusion, but I would like to say that many writers came from other fields and had parallel jobs. So why I landed in children's books field and how. Well, the story is simple and unexpected, even for me. I started writing for my kids 20 years ago when I became mom for the first time. Being mother changed completely my conception of life and showed me with many feelings, not only happiness and joy, but also fear. I realized suddenly that I'm here for, for a quite big and serious mission. 
and I understood and that I'm responsible for other little human beings. I'm responsible for their future, their souvenirs they will carry on for the rest of their lives. I decided to enjoy the trip with them and for them. So I realized how fast time is passing. So I decided to do my best to catch this moment by writing. I use it to keep a notebook and a pencil in my handbag with diapers and bottle feed. And when I was feeling gratitude to the moment, I settled to write some lines about this moment. I could be in a walk in the park or it could be a simple evening at home. I wrote many texts in this, their first, for their first step, for their first feet, for their first day at school. So I had multiple notebooks. I lost many also. And I have realized that only books stay and could remain with me. Uh, in the 10th birthday of my eldest kid, Kinan, I decided to gather all these notebooks and notes and uh, this writing he inspired in a book. So came my first book for him, which I uh, called my birthday for you, my gift for you birthday. I mean, I decided to publish it years after to make it public. So the first book was for my eldest kid. My writing followed my kids' growth and evolution. And because we are living abroad, abroad, far from my home country, Morocco, I felt I have to introduce my family, my childhood and memories to them. They have many questions about my father, their grandpa, they never met. So I wrote for them the wings of my Right. This is a story telling my story where I was writing letters to my dad who passed away in very young age. Also, Emerald Garden was a day from my childhood with my grandma, which I wrote specially to my kids so they can know how great, great my grandma was and how great it is to have a grandma in his life. My story was somehow a time travel for them and for me. So they could meet my childhood through this book. This is my story with how I landed in writing. <laughs> Sorry. You're muted. Muted myself, yes. Yeah, okay. sorry. So it, this is very intriguing because, you know, what, what you're telling me is that, you know, your, your writing was also uh, a companion for your children as they were growing up. So let me come to you uh, and ask you two more things, right? One yeah. is language, right? You're bilingual and I assume your children are also bilingual. So in which language do you write for them, right? And when do you... Do you write in French or in Arabic? And if you write in two languages, when do you choose to write in which language? So this is question number one. Okay. And question number two, uh, the sort of topics, right? Themes, you know, and I hear a lot about memories, your own memories of your own childhood with your own parents in Morocco. And it seems to me that what you're trying to sort of like give your children is something that they don't have access to, right? Morocco, so, growing so, up in Morocco, yeah. memories of yeah. that, but your memories rather than the memories. So can you talk about these two, right? Very sort of like, and okay. tell, tell yeah. us, you know, more yeah. about your work. <laughs> First of all, I will talk about the language, why I choose, uh, which language I choose in, in the beginning and which language I'm using now. When I started writing for my kids, I was automatically writing in French. I don't know why. Maybe because at that time I was living in Paris, or maybe because I, I like this language especially with all the nuances and poetry in this language, French language. But after living in Dubai 
for years. And at my big surprise, I started writing in Arabic. Why? I really don't know. Mm. I cannot say exactly why I chose to, to switch to Arabic. But I was really happy to reconnect with my mother tongue language. Each time I write in Arabic, I enjoy this rich dimension which I was hidden, which was, was high, uh, hidden inside me. So I can write Arabic, French, and sometimes English. English for as my well. child. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes mm-hmm. I, I wrote some passage in. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, in uh, my uh, my gift for to your birthday. It was also in passages in uh, it's it was in three languages so it's by it's, it's multilingual your text is multilingual. yeah yeah, yeah. the first one okay. <laughs> tell us about sort of like how do we play with multilingualism and memory tell us about memory and multilingualism yeah. a little bit more but as i said french was was my first uh my um, not my first language because i was writing in french and i like this 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 dimension of French dimension, these nuances in words. But when I wrote in Arabic, it's like, I don't know, I, I was reconnecting with my grandma, maybe. Mm. I was uh, like with my, my family. My mm-hmm. grandma was talking Arabic, but my mom was talk- is talking French and Arabic. So, so it's like going to my past very my my ancestor i think mm-hmm. this language I, and i feel arabic and i feel it now i feel the word more now than before mm-hmm. for so that i started up, yeah the follow up question lesson. yeah so interesting i mean multilingualism and I, this is what this is our life right this is our yeah, environment yeah this is who we are and we, we're multilingual sometimes we're multilingual. sometimes yeah. confusing and, and each lang- mm-hmm. yeah yeah, but each language has its function. But I want mm-hmm. to come come to a follow up question: Did writing for your children um, get you to pick up an interest in children's literature in general and Arabic mm-hmm. children's literature in particular? I mean, did you pick that mm-hmm. up, right? And I sort of I can sort of frame this when I was growing up in Libya, right? So I heard children's songs, right? And you mm-hmm. you, you see Sanduq Dunya right? Yeah. Uh, like Judy and Punch stuff on TV, but all the children's books were translated, right? Mm. And I didn't know about Arabic children's literature until I was a grown-up and my friend Samah Idris, Allah Yarhamu, mm. wrote Samah his children. Salam. Yeah, mm-hmm. so his, his journey in writing for children is like yours. He wanted mm. to, to preserve he wanted his books to be companions for his children yes. as they grew up and his books sort of grew up with them. And the other thing he wanted to do was to use these books to get them to be interested in the Arabic language. Mm. And the second one is remembrance of the Lebanese civil mm. war, right? So, and these this are the is- very few instances of my knowledge of Arabic children's literature. So let me, did you pick up an interest in Arabic children's literature? I will confess that in the beginning, I didn't know that there is an, a literature uh, dedicated to children. I thought the books for children is what we wrote at, uh, at school mm-hmm. only. So when I, 20 years before, when I, I, I was interested by this field, I started to get to 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 ha- to to be curious to see the new publication in Arabic and other language and to see the translation just to know how big is this field how how writers are dealing with these subjects mm-hmm. and well, I was quite impressed that this field is progressing pretty fast mm-hmm. uh, so from that you can see that my interests grow progressively with my 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 writing and so we're going you to notice hold yeah. On. Yeah. yeah we're going to hold Please. on to this question because i want to come to pam and charlotte in a bit yeah. to ask about the presence of arabic children's literature in the word market outside of the arabic speaking world but before we get there raja you i believe you have an excerpt that you want to share with us would you oh, yeah. read from your short listed book 
yeah. I chose short passages, so I will not uh, be very long and we will let time for others. And uh, I pick uh, page 24. As you say, uh, I will just brief you. This is my demand, or it's my date with, with, uh, with light. It's uh, telling a story about a girl in a very small town in Morocco. This girl has a disease. She's losing her sight, eyesight progressively. And she's living a very hard, hard life with her parents and her family there in Morocco. And instead of losing hope, instead of just let it be and losing his side, her sight eyes, she decided to be, to be a doctor, mm. which is not uh, believable when, when we are and going to be blind. So this is a very long journey, uh, full of uh, surprises and adventures. And in the end, it shows us that dreams and hope are strongest than everything in life. So my passage is like that. It will be she, here. She's uh, she's talking about her uh, childhood. كنت أصغرهم مصابة بهذا الذاء الذي جعلني أعيش بين عالمين عالم المبصرين وعالم العميان. في أدنى سلم العالم الأول وفي أعلى سلم العالم الثاني الأكثر تعاسة في عالم المبصرين والأكثر حدا في عالم العميان تأرجحي بين العالمين جعل مشاعري تتضارب هكذا أجد نفسي أتنقل بين السعادة الغامرة والتعاسة الصامتة في اليوم نفسه دون أن أعرف متى سيلفضني هذا العالم إلى عالم آخر ومتى سيلفضني العالمان لأضيع بينهما لم أنعم بصديقة أو رفيقة كنت تائهة بين نفسي وبيني بيني وبين نفسي من أنا ولم اختارني هذا المرض أنا بالذات Thank you Raja The other if you don't mind it's very small تكاد الأزقة تخلو إلا من أطفال يلعبون الأدوار الخالدة للشرطي والحرامي ويتفانون في أداء في وتفانون في أدائها بجدية بالغة وهم يرتجلون قصصا وحكايات يصدقونها قبل غيرهم غير مدركين أن مصائر أخرى تحاك لهم في كوالس القدر من منهم سيكون في الخندق الخندق الخير ومن منهم سيقذف به في خندق الشر ومن منهم سينتصر للحياة The last one is very short also ها أنا when she decided to return back to her home country as a doctor ها أنا أعود طوعا لقرية ها أنا أعود طوعا لقرية على القطار نفسه الذي لطالما أرعبتني صفارته لموطني طفولتي لجبالي وحارتي لمداخنا ما زالت تنفت الآمال والأحلام ذكرى وحنين وحب لي هناك Thank you so much, Raja. Now let me turn to sort of Pam and Charlotte. Pam first, and set the scene up for us in the UK and in English. I mean, you've heard from Raja the sort of what it is like, right, in Arabic a little bit. So what about here? I mean, it's different, I assume. Yeah, Pam, shall we start with you? Yes, thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me to be here. Um, I think it's a very different scene and um, one that we've been trying within the you know, my world of Ibi in the UK to address as much as we can. So I think the majority of books that are available in the UK in Arabic would be translations from English to Arabic. So they would be books that are part of series that are translated into many languages to try and cater for the needs of, of different language speakers in the UK. Um, we've been aware of this situation for some time and we have done a few projects which you will pick up when you see the slides that I've done. But one of the most interesting ones was to work with our colleagues in France where they had um, done a very good list of 100 children's books in Arabic. And we thought that would, if um, people in the UK would know, could know about that, 
we would help them select books for the Arabic speakers in their communities. So we worked um, collaboratively with France and Ireland to get that list translated so that the librarians and bookshops could see what books were available um, that they could possibly buy, because the difficulty is if you don't speak a language is selecting books in that language. Although I think I have this idea for running a course on how to select a language that you don't speak, because I think there are some um, good activities that we could do there. And again, talking to my French colleagues, they've just done that for school librarians, and it was a very successful training. So um, we've been trying to promote that, promote the award, the various awards. And I'm very aware that the work of um, Sheikh Badur, who is from Kalimat Foundation, has also helped to bring attention to the Arabic world and books that are produced in the Arabic world. And I think as she's president of the International Publishers Association this year, we'll probably hear a lot more from her about, about it. So that's a very brief overview, but I think like many languages spoken in the UK, the children's book provision is not always there to support the children's reading in that language, mm -hmm. unless mm -hmm. the parents have access to buying books from outside the UK market. So Charlotte, what about the sort of the English sort of a book book market? I know sort of like, you know, um, when we met earlier, we talked about how dominant, you know, children's literature in English is in the world. Um, can, can you tell us about a, a little bit about, about the diversity of this body of literature, right? What is being published? Which edge groups, you know, does does the material cover purposes of children's literature? And please, Pam, come back, right, if you want to address these questions as well, right? Um, purposes of children's literature. How big is the market, really? Just tell us more about it, Charlotte. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm <clears throat> delighted to be here. Uh, the the, the, the market for children's books in the UK is a very mature one. Uh, we've been in this country, this country's been producing children's literature, you know, for centuries now um, in, in a very successful fashion. The size of the market is massive. So people often say that children's books take up about a, make up at about a quarter to a third of all the books produced in the country. I asked my colleague to crunch the latest figures through Nielsen um, Bookscan, which looks at the market as a whole. And he said that last year, children's book sales hit 372 million pounds through Bookscan, but that's missing 10 weeks of lockdown. So if we had the full year statistics, they probably would have been on record year. As it stands, the, the, the previous record year is 2019, where sales were 387.6 million. So far in 2022, the children's market is running 3% ahead of that record year. So he is pretty confident that the children's book market will crack the 400 million pound mark for the first time ever by the end of 2022. So that is a very, very, very big market. Um, and publishers in this country produce books for all age groups. And when they say children's publishing, they mean everything from baby books. So for uh, stiff cardboard books for the tiny children, babies all the way up to teen and YA and those can be crossover books so things like the Hunger Games which are also read by adults are, are quite often usually classed as the YA are made by children's um, uh, by children's publishers it's a huge industry so when people say you know there's lots of reasons why people make children's books, but people make children's books primarily because it's an industry, it's a big reason, they want to make money, um, but also because they just love literature, they're passionate about getting children reading, they're passionate mm -hmm. about stories, they love um, opening children's minds to different worlds, different stories, different people, new opportunities. Um, and so in terms, even though it is a business, I think people love what they do and they're very passionate about children's literature as a genre. Can I turn to you then, Pam, because I know you're sort of like uh, you're, you're involved in a charity that is trying to make sure children have access to children's literature. So can I can I said then pick your brains right about why is this important right we have a huge group right and they're very diverse from very young children to young adults young less young children young adults and almost adults something like this right and it, it's a huge market yes but also children love to read and we love to read to them right because you could, could and why is this then important right 
for I us see. as adults. Um, and you think for the children, I know you teach children's literature as well. Um, before I do, I'd just like to add that within the amazing figures, um, Charlotte, I haven't heard those recently, so that's incredible. Um, the children's information book market is also very big. So we're not only talking about stories, but we're talking about information books for children. And that's been a hugely um, popular genre recently. And it's very interesting that a lot of um, contemporary information books for children are written in a narrative style. So they're picking up on that kind of idea of longer text and engagement with story rather than just part, um, sharing a fact. But anyway, to go back to your, your question, um, the, the organisation that I represent, IBI, which is the International Board of Books for Young People, was set up after World War II by an inspirational um, woman called Yella Lapman. Um, and its aim was to encourage that notion of international understanding through children's books. And that need has never gone away in the years since World War II and has become even greater now, I think. So um, what, what the IBI world does is join up the whole children's book producing world, which could be um, the consumers, the parents and, and children, but also teachers, academics, writers, illustrators, and, and so forth, into a, a, a kind of global network where we can share ideas and thinking. And the core of it is, is I mean, I think it's simplified in a, in a theoretical approach that was laid out by Rudine Sims Bishop, the American academic, which is called the windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors theory. And it's basically a summary of the idea that if you see yourself in a children's book, you recognize something. If you look through the mirror, you can see the world of another. And with a sliding glass door, you can open and go into another world. And there have been, and there still are, huge numbers of children who don't get to the starting block because they never see themselves reflected in a children's book because there are no books that are about them. And whilst that doesn't stop them from reading, I think the engagement with reading changes when you've seen yourself in a book or you've seen something about your life or your concerns or your world in a book, which is what Roger was talking about with her writing, I think, really. And that also goes to language. If you've never seen your language written in a book, then you don't think your language can be a book language. And I love um, Roger's example of using three languages in a text, because that's what I hope we'll see a lot more of, because many of our children are growing up in a very multiliterate multi multi environment with grandparents speaking one language, parents speaking a language, and one, another language, themselves being in a community that speaks another language. So, so seeing that development of not necessarily whole text, but just words being incorporated is a great starting point, I think. So, so it's diversity on that bigger scale that I want to see and, and, and what we work towards. And then the other point of it is, is the fact that despite in the UK being a very rich world or throughout the world, there are many children who live in situations where they don't have access to books. They don't have access to libraries. They don't have access to school libraries. They don't have the money for books. So another arm of the world is to run projects in communities that are very challenged. And they may be communities in refugee camps. They may be um, communities in Afghanistan where children are being denied access to school, they may be um, in troubled areas, or they may be situations where because of natural disasters books have been lost. So there's a whole outreach program of getting books to children who are deprived of books. And, and finally, to answer your question of, of why, I think at the very heart of it, everyone who's involved in children's books has this core belief that if they can find the right book for the right child, they can make a reader. And certainly for me as a librarian, as a teacher, that's always been the challenge and the kind of buzz that you get when someone says to you, this is my country, this is me, this is something I can use in my classroom. You feel you've changed the life of someone. So, I mean, that's quite ambitious, but I do feel that that's, that's what drives us. Mm, very nice. I, yeah, yeah. Raja, Raja or Sh uh, Charlotte, would you like to come in or shall I push further? No, please go ahead. I, I, I find it's so, very interesting what I yeah. heard now. Yeah. I, I think sort of like, um, I think all of us, all of us here today will probably share the kind of aspirations that Pam has just sort of articulated on our behalf. Uh, and one of the things is 
really also part of this dream of diversity, right? That diversity, we live in a diverse community and to have that diversity reflected in our writing is very important. And I come back, right, to this point about the absence of Arabic children's literature, right? In two senses, there's one sense is Arabic children's literature is still maturing, is not as old as, right, English children's literature, but the other problem is really, right, sort of the market and the market for the translation of children's literature. So can we talk a little bit about this? And can, can, is there an explanation for that? Why? I mean, I sort of, is it because like, I, I was thinking about it the other day, Harry Potter has been translated in almost every word language and it's made into films. Is it because of this, dominance right of the english children's literature market that is further betrayed by hollywood for example shall we go around the room and say shall we start with you charlotte i, I think the the hollywood um media culture is an interesting thing to talk about and i think especially with teen and ya we perhaps see that there is a funnel, especially American, actually, not so much British, but especially American literature. There seems to be a bit more of a funnel to Hollywood and to those producers, and that happens. And I think what's quite interesting to notice or to note as well is, um, so for example, this autumn, there's a fantastic teenage um, book coming out called um, Where the Lemon Trees Grow about the Syrian war, and it's absolutely wonderful. And the author who wrote it is Syrian. Um, but she grew up partly in um, Dubai and also a little bit in Canada. She lives in Switzerland and she wrote this book um, in English. And it's very, very difficult for anybody to get a book deal. I completely understand that. But I think what is perhaps even harder is to get people who are writing about their, their backgrounds or their countries in their own language, and perhaps because of this dominance of English. You know, that's, that's I think, you know, I'm sure... Pam knows a lot about this, but it would be interesting to look more in to say, well, where are the voices writing in their own language and what can publishers do or even Netflix producers and Hollywood producers to bring those voices to the fore? And that's the challenge, isn't it? Pam? Um, yes, I totally agree. It's a real challenge. And, and I think there are whole parts of the world where writers, we're not hearing their voices at all. Um, so we're dependent on a kind of network of communications between publishers. But, but to just backtrack one step, I mean, we know that uh, 10 years ago, only 1% of the children's books published in the UK were in translation. And when you think of, um, you know, Tintin and Heidi and all the old classics, that means very few of those books were new books. So it's very good now to have some specific publishers who are publishing books that are in translation. And I would single out Pushkin and Enchanted Lion as two publishers who've done some really sort of fantastic work in finding and bringing um, um, books to our attention. But I think it, we are really de dependent on um, the networks within countries to find those voices and to try and put them forward. And, and the best stage is Bologna and the children's book fair at Bologna, because that's where books are bought and sold. And um, I mean, maybe, um, I mean, I, I'm sure there have been Arabic focuses at Bologna, but maybe, for example, it could be the subject of another Bologna book fair with a big focus on promoting some key Arabic books, for example. I mean, I, I had a look this year and there wasn't a great deal about Arabic children's literature in Bologna um, in this first fair, fair that we've had since the pandemic. Um, quite a lot of empty stands with very little going on there. so there, there there were some good stands don't don't get me wrong Calumat being an exemplar but but I think there's more work that could be done promoting local authors on the international stage. Uh, can, can we turn to you Raja then yeah. as part of the children's uh, book? Yeah I agree totally with uh, what uh, this, this lady said uh, and I can say that since its origin cinemas has taken its source from literature and some adaptation has become masterpieces, other has been forgotten. The same goes for children literature, and we know the success of books and movies such as uh, Little Nicola, 
Nicolas mm. Le Petit, and the saga of Harry Potter. So uh, the attraction of cinema to uh, and literature certainly certainly works on dreams and on emotions and feelings. The adaptation of the literature work to the big screen will encourage, I think, the reader to dip in the reading and uh, to discover by word the images discovered on the big screen. And I think this is a good uh, way to promote a book. And uh, I think, and to encourage the young people to read. And I hope Arabic word will, will do the same because he has the potential to do it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the sort of, uh, you know, what is absent in the Arab world is really a, a cinema, like Hollywood cinema. Exactly. Right? exactly. Uh, so we have very small art house cinemas, television, mm. again, you know, sort of national. And mm. it's, it's kind of really, uh, I'm not able to imagine that there is an Arab mm. Hollywood that would sort of adapt children, Arabic children's literature into blockbusters, for example, right? It's yeah. most likely we'll have art house. Um, productions, but, but but let's move that aside and overlap it. Uh, Pam, please come in. Um, yes, I just wanted to add one thing, which I, I would say that more important in the UK market has been um, children's television. And sadly, we see ma many fewer adaptations of children's books than the we, there were in the heyday. But that was a very important vehicle. When, when Channel 4 and the BBC children's programmes were mainstream rather than I mean it's a whole other discussion about what's happening with children's television which I won't go down but you know I I, I for many years was a, a BAFTA judge on children's adaptation films and we just don't see that quality of production anymore so just wanted to make that point yeah so there's something happening in sort of the in the industry and there's something happening in the market but sort of like can we overlap this this, the, these issues with another issues, which is the size of the critical space, right? For introducing, assessing, evaluating, promoting children's literature, and in particular children's literature in translation. Can I come to you, Charlotte, to address this issue? And then Pam, of course. So what I've noticed and that everyone else has noticed is a real lack of space um, in newspapers and magazines to talk about children's books. So what we tend to have now is that a situation where children's book critics or children's book reviewers are only given a page or perhaps even two pages. And when you think about how many children's books are published, I was sent 400 to look at for the month of August. Um, that are coming out next August. Now that's a quiet month in publishing, 400 books just from you know, UK publishers. Um, so what re um, reviewers and critics have to do is pick their favorites. And then, so you get the top picks, you know, the top picks from the Observer or the top picks from the Sun, but that doesn't mean that they are being looked at critically. And the one thing that newspapers always did is that they put reviews in front of people who weren't necessarily looking for children's book reviews. Now there are lots of fantastic, um, websites or social media pages and people pop people will say oh well we can take this online instead but what happens there is that they tend to be read by the people who are looking for um information about children's books perhaps they love david williams so they will go and google david williams and find a children's book blog about it but what they're not seeing then um is reviews about other children's books and also the readers of newspapers who are looking reading their paper and thinking, well, that's an interesting article about the war in Ukraine. I like this um, article about growing flowers in my garden. Oh, look, and actually I might enjoy a bit of critical writing about children's books. And that's just not happening at the moment, which is a bit of a shame. Yeah, um, I, I agree. And sort of, I, I feel that, you know, part of this critical space is also to be able to bring out, you know, the language, right? in children's writing, in writing for children, not children's right, writing for children, writing in children's book, the aesthetic, the fun, right? But also the imagine, imagination that goes into children's literature, right? So can you talk about this a little bit, sort of Pam and Raja and Charlotte as well, if you like, right? 
uh, and the, the the role, the importance of the role in children's literature of children's literature in children's life in children's upbringing. Yeah, sort of. Shall I come to you, Pam, first, and then Charlotte, and then Raja? I I, I would just following on a little bit from what Charlotte said. Um, I, I do think that one of the times when you get um, more coverage in the press is when there are awards. And if the, the agencies managing awards can, can get good press coverage. So, you know, we're about to have the Carnegie Greenaway Awards in the UK. That will always get press coverage. If there's anything controversial, we'll get even more press coverage. So, so that you then get into some kind of sometimes quite unpleasant diatribes about what is children's literature, where is it going? Is this subject matter suitable for children? Should this book have been nominated for an award? So that's the only time that you get real critical space. Um, but to go back to your other question about la language and children, um, I mean, I think that the richness that you can get from reading a wide variety of books is really very important to a child's development. And if, um, if the only books that are being reviewed are not really reflecting the depth and complexity of the market, then children are often reading at a more superficial level than they could do. And they're dependent on librarians and teachers to help them find books that are of, of greater complexity or more challenging to them. Because we know that children read up and down, they read around, they read widely. If they've got an interest in the subject, they're going to read a really complicated text on it, but equally they like to go back to the picture books that they loved when they a little and so so you need to be able to give them access to that diversity to help their language development mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Raja? yes Raja, what about what about your experience of of you know uh your books being reviewed or looked at or promoted yeah do you have any, any sort of like about this uh about the presence of your books you're, you know, in this critical space and sort of like your response to, to that, your feelings about that. You're muted. Sorry, I was, as I said, sorry. I, as I said, I was expecting to, to be uh, in the light uh, by my writings. I, I, I just, I just wanted to into this trip just to talk to my kids and and when I found that my books are here and uh, we're now here to talk about somehow about my experience it's uh, really strange to me it's confusing for me because it wasn't meant to be <laughs> like that it, it was just a whisper from me to my kids uh, and this whisper took these dimensions and when I uh, but me Personally, I tried writing for kids and found myself am I able am myself able to write for teenagers, especially. Uh, I am one of these people who think that we can discuss many topics with children. And uh, I have a lot of um, I choose to talk sometimes about complicated topics like illness, like griefs, like abuses. So and somehow. I took this responsibility, which is not very easy. I have to choose mm -hmm. the words and I have to, to choose, choose the, right, the right words to approach these very big subjects. And uh, yeah, when, uh, when we, we write for kids, we have to know which range we're uh, focusing to. Uh, because writing for, for kids is a big and quite huge responsibility. And we have Absolutely. very extremely wide, uh, wide field. And uh, so zero, from five years or from even before to uh, 12, 15 years. And uh, we can talk about this uh, after in, uh, in how we can approach, if you want, this, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, range of ages i don't know yeah, if i yeah. i answered sort of like to your age questions yeah, yeah 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 i agree yeah, and it's yeah. an important question and i think we're trying yeah. to grapple this question but we're not quite getting there yet but time <laughs> is time is flying right it's almost three yeah. o'clock already so what we could yeah. do is really pause for pam pam you want to do your ppt right 
yes, and then we can you take can. questions. Yeah. Yes. Sh and, shall and I just, share just, it? Yes, and just flag up one oh, other thing, which is just illustration, which is another language for children, yeah. which is very yeah. important. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think you can just um, pass this, the slides over the screen because they're, they, I'll just say what each one refers to because people can look them up. So yeah. if you go to the next slide. Okay. Um, yes. Here I've put um, the three um, IBI resource lists, which are done every two years. The first one is Wordless Books, which came out of a project working with refugees in Lampedusa. And it's a list of wordless books that are published around the world. It's now in its fifth iteration, and it's the most wonderful resource collection, which you can see if you go to Rome. Otherwise, you can see online at the IBI website, the main IBI website. The second is the Honor List, which is done um, nominations by the 80 member countries of IBI and their books in translation, picture books and uh, um, illustrated books. And the third one is the books for and about um, children with disability. And again, that's a collection of books nominated from around the world. This year, when we did the selection for the IBI list, we were submit 90 books were submitted from UK publishers, which is the biggest number we've ever had. Um, the next to draw people's attention if they've never been there to to the International Children's Library in Munich, which um, was also set up after World War II and is a wonderful place to visit if anyone's in Munich. But they produce an annual catalogue called The White Ravens, which is their list of the best books they've seen from around the world. And then the last is just the link to the um, 100 books in Arabic that I mentioned, um, which we did with Ibi which um, is online at the Ibi website. Um, this one, right? It's the, um, it's the bottom. Uh, so I have this first, second. Yes, I think this is this isn't. Yeah, there was a later version of this presentation with another slide. Uh, Don't worry. And then that one is just to remember the Hans Christian Andersen Award winners, which is nominated every two years, and they are what after a very careful selection process by academics and um, panelists are considered to be the best writer and illustrator from around the world. And that is a challenge, I think, to publishers to make them available in many languages. So I've just given you the 2022 winners there. Great, okay. thank you. Uh, stop share, okay. There's something wrong with my computer. It doesn't work properly. All right, sorry about that. Anything else before we sort of open up to questions from the audience? Anybody? I just wanted to um, say really quickly that one thing that is so wonderful about children's books is that they remind us how much we have in common, as well as being able to reach diverse people of all kinds. And, you know, I thought it was, Raja was talking about writing about her grandmother, but also the bad experiences in life, like illness and grief. And a child, children all over the world have those experiences. So a child in Australia or Zambia or Switzerland or Peru, wherever, you know, can read that book and have, and, and the, the experiences that Raja's characters are going through will resonate with them. And I think that's a truly wonderful thing. Um, I think I'll take away from this session the notion that Raja gave of whispering to your children. Maybe we can get more whisperers around the world who can start writing books for their children. I think it's a lovely concept. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, what to say? Uh, I was very delighted, yeah, happy to, to be with you and uh, to talk about myself. It's not a habit for me. I, I never talk about myself. <laughs> I, I like to others talk, my children or my other kids talk about me one day when they will read a book and when they will close the book and something reach them from my, my life. If one word or one sentence uh, touch their soul, I would be very grateful. Okay, great. Thank Thanks you. So Thank I you. have questions from the audience. Yeah. And the first one is to Raja. Did you translate your books by yourself? The first Raja? one, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. You My problem like, that I have yeah. low low battery. <laughs> ah. I don't know how. Uh, okay. Th these if iPhones. That's the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's so, the case. Yeah. Just uh, uh, Let me finish the, Yeah. Let me finish the question. Can you please yeah. Say, yeah. talk to us about your experience in translating your own books? Any difficulties? 
Uh, yeah, because when I'm I translate my I translate my books, I I I'm reading it. I I'm writing again. So <laughs> it's like I'm writing twice. I'm not translating. I'm rewriting in other language. This mm -hmm. is the problem I face. Uh, so if I I write in Arabic and I want to translate in French, suppose. I'm writing in Arabic and another in French. It's not similar words, it's not the similar path, but it's the same feeling. So I prefer that someone else objectively will translate it. It's better than me because me, I will involve myself in the translations. If you got me, <laughs> I don't know yeah. if I'm <laughs> yeah. <in> this. <laughs> I do the same. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm rewriting in another language. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is what. <laughs> I hate oh. translating myself. Yeah, I was yeah, asked yeah. to do it. I was like, exactly. Ah. I don't know yeah. if they can catch my, my yeah. sen the sense of what I'm seeing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's another question for you, right? What do you feel Arab writers need to work on more so that their books become more appealing to kid readers? Ideas, style, diversity in topics, others, what do you think? And I think this is a question for all of us, right? Exactly. For all of you. Yeah, so we'll start with Raja and we come to Pam yeah. and then come to Charlotte. Raja. I used to say that when we write for kids, we have to be, we have to write for the kids in the, inside us. We have to, to find the kids inside us and to be just as we are, to say what we, we're feeling and to say the truth with the simple words. This is what um, I can advise humbly to others. Arab, uh, the writer, he, his job is to write, but the reader has a job to read. So if writers just write, they should have an audience. The parents should help and encourage their kids to write. If me, I'm writing for someone and, and this someone is not coming to, to, to find my words, it's, it's like, uh, what to say, it's hopeless. So writers and readers should meet somewhere and this somewhere should be uh, a truth story, mm -hmm. a true story and uh, a true feeling inside. That's that's I can say about about what I advise writer to do, and also I think that cinema was uh, the, the production film producer should should into, uh, have an interest to the kids books. And one of my what I um, one of my dreams is to do a, a small short films or cartoons from my books. This would be. A good, a good, uh, good thing to do for me and for uh, for uh, kids. And so this is experience I wanted to to Arabic words. I don't know if they will. Uh, there is someone to to be interested in that, but this is my hope. I At hope least for my little my little uh, books. Okay, I hope you'll be heard. Pam, inshallah. Mm. Uh, I think the comment that I would like to make, just from the Arabic books that I've looked at is the need for illustrators to be more confident about oh. their own style. Because, I mean, this is a very sweeping generalization and I, I know that I could be very challenged for it, but I see many books that are a halfway house between uh, cultures and often derivative of European illustration style. Maybe because they've been taught or been on courses with European illustrators and I think um, they need confidence to develop their own style which yeah. makes their own cultural reference and to tell their own traditional stories uh, as well as uh, absorb European literature so I'd like to see more 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 of that happening that's a very broad yeah. overview I know but I mean I, obviously I don't read Arabic so I can't comment on the content of many stories but I've been very disappointed at the number that are just end up being not one thing or the other, I think, in terms of illustration. And I mm -hmm. think illustration is the, one of the most powerful ways of getting exactly. children to engage with story. Mm -hmm. So before I turn to Charlotte, uh, there is a request for you. Could you please share the link of the IBI list of the words illustrators? Is it on the PPT? Yes. Um, the the illustrator the illustrators list or the yeah. uh, is illustrators uh, list 
There isn't a, an Ibi illustrators list, but illustration is a category every two years in the honor books list. Is that, I hope that's what the person was referring to. That's the, and that's no, on the, yeah, yeah. ibi.org, not, not ibi.org.uk, but ibi.org, which is the international site. So Charlotte, shall we come to you? I think uh, I can't speak uh, specifically for books um, written in Arabic for children, but I think in general, I agree with Raja that emotional truth and emotional honesty is very important, as is seeing um, the world through um, a child's perspective. Um, would they experience having to go to a food bank the same way that an adult would? Would they experience their parents losing a job um, in the same way that their parents would? What would be their feelings about that? You know, good experiences and bad, I think, is really important. Um, and also, I think there's a balance between being authentic to yourself, which is incredibly important, but also being aware of what the market is and what is selling and what is being published, because ultimately you do have to get somebody to agree to publish your book and they have to like what they see. And they buy books not just because they like them, they think they can sell them. They think this book has a place and a purpose in the market. They think it will reach that reader that they want to reach that they haven't reached already. So uh, just reading widely of the books that you like and you admire. So if you like a certain children's author, really read it quite critically, look at the illustrations, look at the text and work out what, what you love about it and why you think that works for, for a child audience. Great. Um, I think these are all the questions you have. So we can come we can come to a conclusion on that very nice note, beautiful note. So thank you again, my panelists, Pam, Charlotte, and Raja, for thank taking you. part in this event. And I hope you enjoyed it. I definitely did. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, and thank you, you all for well, coming. It's a pleasure and meeting you. Thank you. Pleasure meeting you. Bye. Oh, thank you. Bye, thank guys. You.